Thank you. Are you ready for some magic, some technology magic? That's what I'm here for. We're going to talk about my story of how I've used technology and a bit of magic to uh, realize the vision uh, in my career. This is my ride to the cloud. So the ride is really more like surfing, like riding very large technology waves. In my case, to develop uh, uh, medical applications uh, software, you too can uh, ride these waves, uh, taking you very fast, but also they are very, the quite a variety of technology that you can use even today to fulfill your, uh, overcome any challenges, particularly technology challenges in your career. So if you're ready, get on the board and uh, see where the wave takes us. So my story starts back in 1969 when I was fortunate to get a job with a power company where they actually taught me computers and programming. Back in 69, these were not subjects that were being taught in, uh, even in the top universities. Uh, back then, computers uh, like this were called mainframe. They were over a million dollars each. And uh, you'd be amazed to understand that the smartphones that you have with you today have uh, faster processing and more storage than this uh, mainframe computer. So, We've come a long way in 30 years, and that's part of the theme, not only how fast technology moves, but what you can do with it. By 1971, mini computers came on the scene, uh, and the smaller, now you can fit them in a closet, and less expensive, uh, 100,000 rather than a million dollars, but still uh, incredibly limited. Uh, again, consider that the entire uh, memory of these devices, both in uh, to put uh, applications and data, is less or was less than five megabytes. That is about the attachment of an email today. So it was uh, challenging to program them, but uh, because I've had the training, I was uh, able to do that, and it actually is a transition for me because they were being introduced in the medical imaging field. So I went into that, and specifically in nuclear cardiology. Now, as I started working with physicians, I noticed how proud they were of their art of image interpretation to reach a diagnosis. Yet I recognized that uh, I would give the experts the same images Two different experts would often come with very different conclusions. And that one observation became the vision for my career. And that is to use technology to transform the art of image interpretation to the science of image interpretation. And everything else I'll tell you will be related to that. So also consider that in 1983, no one was paying for software. So uh, you had a $100,000 system for the hardware. They would throw in whatever software uh, was just necessary. But because no one wanted to pay for the software, uh, it was limiting our clinical medical applications. So you can see in this editorial that I wrote back in 83, an appeal to the community to start paying for software. But now you have the medical experts that are still reluctant to change from art to science, and you have the fact that they were already paying $100,000 for devices. Now we're asking them to pay for something else. So you can imagine this was part of the challenges. It's, the challenge is not only technological, but it's also uh, financial. So the only way, or the best way, to convince physicians to use a technology is to prove to them how it helps their patients. So let me go a little more specifically into my field of nuclear cardiology uh, so that you understand uh, the rest of the presentation. In, uh, in what we do, uh, in our field, we inject radioactive chemicals that go specifically uh, to the muscle of the myocardium, the muscle of the heart, which pumps the blood uh, to the rest of the body. 
And in, this, uh, in, in the top panel, what I'm showing you there is cutting through slices that look like donuts for the cavity that pumps the blood. And you can see that the colors are white uh, or yellow, consistent with high blood flow. So this is a normal patient. And when the, you uh, stack the slices uh, from tip of the heart to the base, and we plotted them in a polar map, uh, this became our representation of what the heart looks like, a quantitative representation that could statistically compare, uh, as I'll show you in a minute. Now, why such a simple thing for such a difficult uh, subject? Because in 1983, computers were very slow, and the software didn't really exist, for example, for three-dimensional rendering. So consider this other patient where, uh, again, we're looking at the polar maps. The top left is uh, during exercise. And you can see that no longer do those polar maps look uh, uniformly yellow, but around 12 o'clock, it looks like it's uh, blue, which is reducing blood flow. And at that same patient at rest improves. So first of all, the physician has a, an easy uh, representation of the, uh, uh, of the heart. But also, we could compare these statistically to databases that we had in our lab. And uh, uh, we, can we could highlight in black, uh, you see in the bottom left panel, uh, the regions that were significantly reducing blood flow during exercise. And in white, we will highlight the regions that significantly improved during rest. Now again, it appears to be quite a simple uh, concept. There doesn't seem to be much magic so far. But if I can just skip to today, just for a second, realize that uh, this program, there's over 35,000 licenses of it all over the world, and that over 4 million patients are analyzed every year with this software. So uh, of course, it's a little more complicated than what I showed you. But in fact, uh, uh, these ideas can help a lot of patients uh, in, a, in a short time. Now, by the year 2000, computers have gotten faster. Uh, there was a lot more software. So what you're seeing here is uh, 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 where we fuse our technology with other imaging modalities. And now we can render in three dimensions. And of course, it looks a lot more realistic than the, than the polar maps that we showed you before, even though the uh, physicians, believe it or not, they still prefer the polar maps because they were trained that way. Now, it, during those years, uh, that's when the personal computers came into the scene. Now, think about it. We went from a million dollar computer to a hundred thousand dollar computer to a thousand dollar computer. And this thousand dollar computer is tremendously more powerful than either of the other two with a lot more software storage and, uh, uh, and performance. This is why one of the things that we did is a spin off a company so that we could take advantage of this and uh, offer it to end users for a lot less cost. Now, it was also about this time that we started experimenting with artificial intelligence. As you know, this is the uh, technology where the, comp the computer tries to emulate how humans make decisions. So in this approach that you see here uh, is uh, is called neural networks, where what we try to do here is cluster, uh, uh, simulate how we can cluster neurons in the brain to make a decision. And the way we trained the computer to learn how to make these interpretations was to offer it as input our imaging data in terms of the blood flow to the heart and clinical data. And the output would be the known uh, the known interpretation or the known diagnosis of the patient. And you will offer many, many thousands of studies for the computer to learn how to do it. Now, the technique we ended up using is the one on the, the, is using certainty in decision support. Think of certainty as a probability. If you have a lot of data, just like before, but if you don't have a lot of data, it can be just an expert opinion. So the systems are built up in terms of uh, rules from experts. And as patient information comes in for a specific patient, it either is used as positive or negative evidence. 
that, uh, uh, that the patient, if it's positive evidence, it says the patient is abnormal. If it's negative evidence, is that the patient is normal. And as all the input and all the evidence comes in, wherever you end up at, that certainty becomes the final diagnosis. Appreciate that this is all using the English language. And both the rules are written in English and the justification, the tracking of how we reach that conclusion is also written in English. Which brings us to the next huge technology wave that all of you are experiencing, and that's the area of natural language processing or computerized language understanding. And because not only am I communicating with you in natural languages, but us communicate with computers in natural language, either from the different search engines to search something that we want, or the virtual assistant to get something that, uh, that we need, uh, the er this area, imagine, in the last 10 years, the uh, progress has been phenomenal. Now, how can we use this? How can we combine this with what we previously did uh, with the artificial intelligence systems to generate clinical reports? How can we put them together? And this is where the magic comes in. And the magic is, we call Merlin. And, uh, uh, and why do we need Merlin? appreciate that once we send the systems out, the system stops learning. So this is just like a physician that graduated and never read another article, never went to a meeting. So it doesn't, it stops, doesn't know any, any of the new things. So in Merlin, Merlin, we programmed it so that it would read uh, clinical research articles in our domain, it would extract the knowledge, uh, any new knowledge that it thought it found. It would then test that knowledge against large databases in our systems. And if the knowledge, is the new knowledge, increased the accuracy of uh, the diagnosis, it incorporated that knowledge into, the, uh, into these expert systems. So uh, it's uh, quite a bit of uh, progress in terms of using natural language processing in our field. Now to implement, so think about it. Merlin could do this every night, right? And by the time you wake up in the morning, you have new data, you have better diagnosis, you have new rules. It read all the scientific articles for you. To implement programs like Merlin and to continue the progress in our particular clinical application, uh, Another huge technology wave has been the uh, increasing the speed of the internet. And uh, appreciate that, that the scale here is an exponential scale. So in the last 20 years, the speed of the internet has been improving at the rate of 50% per year. Again, because uh, all of us are using it and it makes the right business model. So what does that facilitate? It facilitates cloud computing. And this, this is my, my right to the cloud. This is one of the clouds that I uh, was talking about. And as you know, you use the cloud and you think of it as a storage place in that uh, uh, you can, not only you can store, but retrieve movies and photos and songs and things like that. We do the same thing, but we also store, uh, we upload into the cloud all of the patient imaging data. But for us, the cloud is more than just a place for storage. It is a place, most clouds usually have hundreds of computers and servers attached to it, which means that uh, this little laptop in, in the bottom right can access the, uh, all those computers and, and uh, can have billions of operations per second. So now we've been able to also uh, load this, our, our program in the cloud and have it process read the data that's already in the cloud, the program in the cloud, and when you're in the laptop, it appears to you as everything is happening locally, but it's actually happening remotely. Now, this strategy also allows us to use a huge amount of imaging data because uh, the, uh, the institutions that have this service are loading up all their images to the cloud. So now we have hundreds of thousands of studies that we can use to train our artificial intelligence system, and even to look at trends in the field. 
So this brings us to the fourth version of our program, which we call the MRD Cardiac Toolbox, and, uh, uh, which is cloud compatible. And as I mentioned, it has the, uh, uh, the functions of artificial intelligence for reporting. It has cloud storage retrieval, and it can be processing. And this can be done anywhere in the world. So in fact, uh, a physician can't uh, read the studies uh, uh, in a different country as though they were sitting at their office. Now there's a part of the story that I've skipped and it's an important part because success or failure comes at a cost. And for me that cost was that uh, in 2008, I had a chest pain event which uh, was uh, initially considered to be insignificant. But when the, I was uh, submitted to our modality and process with our program. You can see in the bottom right in yellow, it shows that 26% of the blood flow to my heart had been reduced at stress, and at rest, it had improved significantly, but only 7% had returned, uh, meaning that I lost about 7% of the muscle of my heart to a heart attack. This could have been a one-way ticket to the cloud also, but, <laughs> but fortunately, my, uh, my function was preserved, the pumping function of the ventricle, uh, that 7% did not influence it enough uh, to bother it, so this shows a good prognosis. And when the, artif the artificial intelligence report comes out totally generated by the computer, I won't be reading everything that it says, but the final thing is the impression that uh, abnormal high-risk study. Yet, I was reassured because of the fact that I knew how the program worked how we reach an objective conclusion that uh, I really had the disease and I understood the treatment that I needed. This brings us to the theory of everything, that uh, uh, find a formula that solves all your, uh, all your questions. So think about it. When we put together cloud storage and retrieving and processing, increase internet speed, big data, computerized natural language understanding, and artificial intelligence for decision support, not only using one of those, but putting it all together, you can pretty much answer uh, every problem that we have today and many that we'll have in the future. So just to conclude that this also brings us to the present trend that we're having, which becomes a future trend, and that is that a very inexpensive device can access everything any service that it needs, any data that it needs, but that from the business point of view, this also implies a trend in changing from ownership to paying for service. Because now you're only gonna be paying for what you need, when you need it, but you have the latest, uh, the latest technology available to you. So with that, I hope you got something from this, uh, um, this talk. And uh, we have enjoyed our ride. I hope that you enjoy your ride using one or all these kinds of technology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much.